All right. Um, so the last two presentations, I guess, uh, um, gave us a couple of tools, like handy tools, uh, for doing robotics, like uh, kinematics. Uh, so this is the first lecture typed in on controls. And I guess we, we didn't quite get all the way to dynamics uh, last time. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not completely derive everything, but uh, I'm going to start at uh, this equation. Uh, dot plus C equals dot. So uh, those are the equations of motion for, uh, for basically any mechanism like any robot consisting of joints and rigid bodies, uh, like the one we've been, uh, yeah, we've analyzed kinematically in the last couple of lectures. Uh, assuming that there's no external forces acting on it. So there's no uh, F here or whatever. So this is, uh, um, yeah. All right, so uh, this is the type of system that we're gonna look at and that we're gonna derive controls, controls equations for, I guess. And first, let's let's consider just uh, a robot arm that's that's bolted to a table or something. So uh, that means that there are uh, joints that are actuated all along the kinematic chain. So there's no unactuated joints. And uh, so let's try to come up with a way to control that type of system. Um, so typically, what you want to do in robot control is track some kind of trajectory. Uh, try to achieve uh, certain joint positions. Um, yeah, in like a, uh, as a function of time. So you can imagine that there's like some trajectory uh, QD of T that you're trying to achieve. So you want to have your joint angles, which don't actually appear in this uh, in this equation. But uh, so everything changes with the joint angle, so we have M of Q and uh, C of Q and Q dot even. So th that's how they, uh, that appears in this equation. Uh, you, you're going to try to uh, achieve those joint angles as a function of time as closely as possible. Uh, and by the way, this C thing, uh, yeah, terminology. So uh, this V dot is just the joint acceleration vector we saw last time. Uh, so it's a derivative of that joint velocity vector. Uh, M is a mass matrix. Um, so for, for example, for a simple point mass, it's just uh, the, the V vector could be uh, just the, the velocity in, uh, in Cartesian space, so V in R3. And then this M matrix, the mass matrix, would just be like M's on the diagonal. And, and, and uh, there would be no C, or at least um, uh, unless you're on, in gravity, because then uh, gravitational terms pop up. So then, then C would be C equals uh, zero, zero, uh, what is it? Positive mg, I guess. Uh, and tau, tau would be like the, the forces you can exert on it in all three directions. Um, if you have a more complicated system with the joints in it and stuff, then uh, another thing that pops up in the C is, um, well, two things happen basically. The, the gravitational terms uh, are going to be dependent on the joint angles. Here there's no joint angles, there's no uh, x in it. But if you, if you, have, you have joints, that, that uh, could pop up. And uh, there's also terms that depend on the velocity, which are Coriolis terms. Uh, but so again, I'm not going to draw them all of that. Uh, all right. So we have this trajectory that we're trying to track, Q desired of T. 
uh, how can we do that? Well, there's, uh, there's this one, there's this uh, uh, tool called PD control, which is sort of the basic thing that everybody uses. Um, and so basically the, the problem is to come up with uh, joint torques that make, make your uh, joint positions track this thing. So, and PD control can be written as uh, tau equals uh, k times q desired minus q plus d times uh, q dot desired, so the derivative of this function, minus, uh, minus q dot, well let's, let's actually do desired minus B. So again, you want to use, these might be of different sizes, like these vectors, because you want to uh, describe orientations uh, redundantly. Um, but let's, for, for this uh, example, let's just say we do Q double dot here, because it makes things a little bit easier. So Q dot minus Q, and then this becomes Q dot desired minus Q dot. Okay, so let's try filling that into that equation. Let's see what happens. Um, and really what I'm interested in is, is what Q dot, Q double dot is gonna end up being. So let, let's first solve for Q double dot. So Q double dot equals uh, M inverse times uh, tau minus c. That's right. It's tau, so c goes over here, and then you can multiply m inverse. Uh, and this mass matrix is uh, positive semi-definite, or so positive definite, sorry. So it's guaranteed to have an inverse. Um, and actually, I'm not, I'm not even interested in the joint accelerations per se. I'm interested in uh, the dif difference between the desired joint acceleration according to the uh, trajectory and the actual one. So that's uh, Q double dot desired minus Q double dot. And that's, that's really uh, the second derivative of error, basically. So it's, you can uh, interpret the difference between the uh, actual trajectory and the uh, desired as an error. So this is E double dot error double dot. Uh, that is simply Q, dot, Q double dot desired minus this. So Q double dot desired minus, uh, well let's do actually plus uh, M inverse uh, tau minus M inverse C, right? Uh, okay, so let's see. What's that? What's that? The Q dot. You have minus Q double dot on the left side. So I think the equation above it needs to have a minus M inverse, uh, but it's minus M inverse tau. Sorry, what, what needs that one? Is it minus M inverse tau and plus M yeah, inverse Yeah, you're right. You're right. See? Okay, so uh, let's put that, that in here for tau. Um, equals Q double dot desired minus M inverse. Well, let's, let's actually call it, uh, just shorten this to tau equals PD of Q dot desired and Q desired. Um, so that's, that's going to be tau uh, M inverse PD, Q dot desired minus comma uh, Q desired plus 
n inverse of c. So that's the, uh, those are the, uh, this is basically the error dynamics. Um, so you see that uh, if you have a certain desired uh, acceleration according to your tra trajectory, then you can't react to that immediately. Because uh, so, so we have this q double dot desired. Uh, that's going to change. And so that's going to make the error grow. But then later on, it's going to be corrected by this term, but only later on. So there first needs to be an error <coughs> in order for it to correct for that error or to come closer to the uh, desired. And also we have this m inverse c here. So that's uh, gravitational terms and Coriolis again. And uh, there's, there's really nothing correcting for that except errors also, right? So let's try, to, let's try to find a better solution. So just simple PD control on the torques gives you this, but let's, let's try something better. Um, how about we start off with just this? Uh, we fill in the desired acceleration for, for Q double dot here. So that's m, so tau equals, we're coming up with a new control law, tau equals m q double dot desire uh, plus c, and then plus this pd term still, because we want to be able to correct for any errors that, that we have. Like if we, if we just use this, then uh, there's nothing correcting for errors, right? There's nothing comparing measurements to actuals, so errors just grow unbounded. So let, let's add this plus pd. So would you use, for c, would you use desired or actuals? Uh, uh, always actuals, yeah. Because actuals are what matters uh, in terms of the, the uh, torques that are sort of being exerted. Um, on the video part before? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes actuals are noisier if you're trying to like compensate by the viscous friction. Well, but yeah, every everything is based on uh, on measurements. So if your if your measurements are noisy, then you're gonna yeah. be screwed anyway, I guess. Um, yeah. For example. Uh, like an, a case where it would be bad to use actuals is uh, if you have a step change. Nah. It's hard also. You're trying to cancel the natural dynamics to do what you want, so you yeah. have to know what's actually happening. Yeah. Yeah. In that case, I've, I've sort of been going back and forth, but in the end, I decided different different that people do it differently. Yeah. <coughs> I, I kind of like this better. It's not going to be too much different for positions and velocities. What you don't want to use is actual acceleration. Yeah. There you always want to use acceleration. Actual yeah. acceleration. Um, it's not really a state variable anymore. So it's yeah. It really doesn't make sense to use it. Yeah. All right. So let's let's put that in uh, in this equation. So so this was like our first option. This was just plain PD control on the torques. Um, And second one, let's uh, put that in there. So we're going to have uh, Q double dots desired still minus M inverse tau. So let's do that's uh, M inverse M Q double dot. So that's Q double dot desired. Okay. Then M inverse C. Uh, so that's another minus. Minus M inverse C, okay. Plus, uh, sorry, not a minus. M inverse uh, PD. I'm not going to write the arguments, but so this is just the output of that function. Uh, plus M inverse C still. It's known as computed torque method. Yeah. Yeah. So these Q double dot desireds cancel out. And the, the Coriolis terms also cancel out. Assuming a perfect model. 
Assuming a perfect model, of course, yeah. So that's going to end up being just uh, negative m inverse dd of q dot desired and q desired. So that looks a lot cleaner. Now, again, assuming that we have a perfect model, there's no, uh, like we were able to use uh, the information we have about the trajectory in terms of accelerations to sort of, uh, we don't have to wait for an error to appear in order for, for us to start correcting for it or to start um, generating effort. Yeah, starting gener generating torques, so effort, yeah. Uh, so that's that's a lot nicer, um, and it's the same thing for the the Coriolis and gravity terms. We we sort of we're compensating for gravity all the time, and even for Coriolis terms due to us moving, so the the velocity based terms. So that's that's a lot a lot nicer, um, but the thing is that with this PD, uh, the PD. Um, let's see. I want to do one more thing here. Here. Error dynamics are now second order governed by a second order. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a lin now it's a linear second order equation. However, it's still uh, very coupled. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, so this this PD or in general, I guess uh, this PD thing. Really, what you what you want to do is uh, we we are writing PD of <coughs> Q dot desired and Q desired is uh, uh, what was it k times q desired minus q x q plus d times q dot desired minus q dot okay um, so these these are matrices the k and the d since these are vectors uh, really the, normally what everybody does is just create matrices or yeah diagonal matrices basically so you take your error in uh, the joint position for joint one and the error in velocity for joint one and then you create uh, you calculate a torque for joint one based on that right uh, so these these are diagonal but since here you're pre-multiplying this mass matrix which is not usually diagonal uh, you get these sort of coupling terms. So you're trying to, uh, for example, you're trying to uh, compensate for an error in your elbow joint. But in trying to do that, you're causing torques. Uh, you're basically not compensating for torques that are then causing errors in other joints. So basically what you get is this. Uh, can you? Yeah. So this is this is just a floating lag, basically. This was uh, R two's lag, uh, or it's not floating. Sorry, it's uh, it's fixed right here. And uh, what I'm trying to do is uh, track step changes. So the the trajectories are really simple. Uh, there's no there's really no Q double dot desired because there's a, like a step change. Um, so it's really all about what the PD term does. Um, so it's, it's compensating for gravity, so in the end it converges to what it should be. There's no steady state error. But it, it looks very shaky. Or, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't track very nicely. Uh, so what can we do? And that has, um, that's doing full and reverse dynamics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you come back here. So, so this is also called inverse doing inverse dynamics, right? So you, you take your normally forward dynamics is going from uh, torques to joint accelerations, but here what we're doing is going from uh, desired joint accelerations to torques. So, so this part m q double dot desired plus c, that's inverse dynamics. And in code, by the way, we have algorithms for calculating exactly this. So in, uh, it's called an inverse dynamics calculator. Uh, there's a special algorithm for that uh, that works on any um, robot you create using all of those joints and stuff. So it's, it works nicely together. 
Uh, alternatively, you, there's also uh, a class that separately computes this mass matrix and uh, the, the, the Coriolis terms and gravity terms. So if you want to do it that way, it's also possible. Um, yeah, so, but let's try to make this even better. Uh, how about we do this? Uh, so this is our second option. Yeah. Tau equals, or, mm, yeah, okay, let's do that. Tau equals mqw dot desire. We like that. Plus C, still doing inverse dynamics. Plus uh, M, PD of Q dot desired and Q dot, or in uh, Q desired. So then, since all we've changed is uh, pre multiplying this ma mass matrix, we just get for the third option negative PD of Q dot desired and Q desired. So now we get rid of the coupling by pre-multiplying that mass matrix. And, and really what you're doing is um, you're, um, you're computing new desired joint accelerations. It's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, of course. So, really, you can see this also as equals m q double dot desire plus pd of q dot desired and q desired plus c. So, so really, what you're doing is you're calculating. You're not taking the desired joint accelerations from your trajectory, but you're actually adding this PD term here, and then you're doing inverse dynamics. So you're, you're basically <coughs> taking the, the PD control inside the inverse dynamics loop. And is that a reference, is that called something like a reference acceleration? Yeah, I guess this, this would be... The, the whole... Uh, I'm not sure. Look back at notes in the class, but yeah. remember, a new acceleration term that was not just Q double dot desired. Mm. Yeah. So if we go back here to the video. I think it actually. Uh, Jerry, did you take it? All right. So this is with this, this new control law. So it's truth. And I, I uh, made the, uh, the PD gains such that um, such that it's all critically damped. So that's another nice thing you can do now. Uh, since everything, basically pre-multiplying the mass matrix means that everything is just a, a unit mass second order system. And then it's all, all of the degrees of freedom are decoupled. So for every degree of freedom, you can just use the same uh, gains. And uh, if you calculate uh, the gains using, using a damping ratio, so you choose a damping ratio of one for a second order system, then it's just going to be uh, critically damped for all of the degrees of freedom independently. So that looks a lot nicer. So you couldn't do that for the other one because of the coupling between? No. Yeah, so you, you have this big matrix equation still, and that there's, there is coupling. So there's, there's no simple uh, way of coming up with gains uh, in that situation, well, I mean, basically, the, the way for coming up with gains that do this involves basically just pre-multiplying this mass matrix. Um, yeah, but since that mass matrix decouples everything, afterwards you can just use your standard second order system, single degree of freedom uh, equation to, to calculate gains. So that's really nice. Okay. What are there different names for the three hmm. methods? I, or you know, I'm thinking I, I think I've known two is computed torque method. Okay. <coughs> and I'm gonna look up in the notes. I took a you know kind of bio class where we did like this on a two-link manipulator. Mm -hmm. And you know I've 
probably looked at those notes like three times now, and I've forgotten them, of course. Okay. But it was pretty good class because we, you know, learn this and then go onto the arm and implement these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And yeah. Oh, so the, the, the third one I have sometimes called the crack page three hundred controller because <laughs> it's like on three page three hundred of the crack book introduction to robotics book. I think we called it reference like. I think we call that QR, Q double dot R. Okay. And Q double dot R was Q dot with that linear error term. Then, then I think instead of we use PD, I think we just called it E, you know, E yeah. and E dot with sure, maybe sure. a gain on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, All right. Uh, okay. If I find the notes, I'll put them up somewhere. So I should just digitize it. We've seen so many variations. That yeah really care about the name anymore. <laughs> all right, so this is, all of this assumes that we have these uh, Q double dot desireds, right? So we, we have Q double dot desired for, and now I'm actually gonna go back to, uh, yeah, sure, V, V desired, and V dot desired. Um, but maybe that's not what we're trying to do. Maybe we're trying to, uh, for example, make our foot go to a certain uh, position and orientation in Cartesian space. Uh, so one way to, to do that is to basically do inverse kinematics and figure out for that final position what the joint angles and joint, yeah, what, what the joint angle should be. And then spline in joint space. Uh, another option, that, which I think is cleaner, is uh, to, to actually track in Cartesian space. So you create a a trajectory in Cartesian space. So for example, a straight line. Um, and then you try to follow that trajectory. Uh, so how do you do something like that? Uh, really what you're, what you're trying to do, for example, if, if we have a robot that looks like this, we have the world here, first joint, body one, body two, body three. So remember that you can write the twist of this thing, uh, of, the, of the end effector, like the leaf in this tree, body number three as T of three with respect to world expressed in frame three. Um, and I showed that you can write that as J three W three times V, where V is uh, the joint velocity vector of all of these uh, joints, basically. Now, suppose that we differentiate. Well, let me actually use a um, simpler notation right now, since it doesn't really matter. It's very clear what I mean. Uh, T equals JV. So if we differentiate this equation on both sides, the, the equal sign, we get T dot equals j v dot plus j dot times v. Okay, so now we have like the derivative of the twist as a function of joint accelerations and current joint velocities. Um, and we can do pretty much something, something uh, similar to what we did for the, the joint space trajectories, but now in task space, uh, by, by saying that we have a trajectory that gives us uh, h, so basically h from 3 to world as a function of time, and then uh, t as a function of time, and also t dot as a function of time. And we can do, so t dot, these are all desires, t and I'm gonna steal that reference thing and just do uh, t dot reference is t dot desired uh, plus some PD term based on our H desired and the T desired. And how, how you do this PD term, I'm not gonna show right now, but uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, yeah, it, it involves converting the rotation matrix to axis angle form. 
which I haven't shown yet, so, so that's why. But that's also implemented in, implemented in code. Already. There's lots of examples of that. So now we have some, some reference uh, uh, spatial acceleration, really. So the derivative of twist is, I call it spatial acceleration. That's what uh, Featherstone also calls it. Um, and based on this spatial acceleration, we can compute uh, joint accelerations. And then we can just do the exact same thing. So that's really nice. So we're basically saying, uh, if, if we solve, try to solve this for v dot, we get uh, j v dot equal, uh, equals d dot minus j dot v. And then we can say v dot equals j inverse uh, times t dot minus j dot v. So now we have our joint accelerations again, and we can just use the same uh, type of control law. So as long as you have joint accelerations, and, and so these, these joint accelerations, if you use uh, t dot reference here, they already incorporate a PD term. So you don't actually have to do uh, PD control on the, the joint accelerations themselves. You can just do it in Cartesian space and then, uh, and then use this to map it to joint accelerations. And then after that, you use the inverse dynamic stuff uh, to calculate torques again. So this is how you do uh, joint, uh, sorry, task space control. Um, another option, well, yeah, okay, another simple uh, example of things you can do is uh, suppose you have fewer joints. Um, so this, this basically assumes you have six joints uh, and, uh, or six degrees of freedom, basically, and so that this uh, joint or this Jacobian, it really it, it assumes that this Jacobian is invertible. So you have to have six degrees of freedom and you need to make sure that you're not in a singularity. Um, suppose you only have three joints like here, then you can only do a certain subset of what you want. So, so one, one thing you can do is uh, just pre-multiply a selection matrix so then you have, uh, for this equation, you have some s <coughs> times j v dot equals s t dot minus j dot v, where, where this s is something like, uh, uh, for example, Let's do one zero 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 one zero and here. So this would mean that you you only really care about uh, angular velocity. So basically, uh, whereas before we had six equations, now we're getting rid of three of the equations, like. Basically, the bottom three equations. You missed the one. Yeah. Oh, did I? Sorry. And uh, and so we we have fewer constraints basically, and then we can solve like this again. V dot equals S J inverse S T dot minus j dot v. So, so here, in this case, j would be, uh, uh, what is it? Six rows, six by three. And s is three by six. So that should leave a square matrix. And then uh, hopefully we can invert that. And, and then this is how you calculate uh, joint accelerations. So that's another thing you can do. Uh, but so the, the big thing is, I keep saying, you need to be able to invert either either this, the whole Jacobian, or some selection matrix times the Jacobian. 
And it's, it often occurs that that's not possible, uh, especially in, in legged robots. Um, when you're walking along, uh, often you have your knee stretched, which means that you can't accelerate in the, in the direction, in, in this direction, basically. Right? You, you can't accelerate upwards uh, without, without first getting out of that singularity. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's a problem. Even bigger, um, yeah, OK, Let, let's do that first. Yeah. So that's problem number one. Singularities. Then another problem is you might be uh, over constrained. So you might be wanting to try to uh, achieve uh, the, the spatial acceleration, the full spatial acceleration of the end effector, uh, whereas you only have three. Uh, three joints to do it. So you can't just achieve any spatial acceleration you want. So you're, you're over constrained, basically. And like one way to solve that is that with the selection matrix. But yeah, th there are other, other options. So over constrained. And another problem is the opposite, uh, being under constrained. So uh, you might have uh, j v dot equals v dot minus j dot v, where uh, this j uh, is, for example, 6 by 8, and this v dot is 8 by 1. So this j is not invertible since it's not square. Uh, but you still might be able to achieve the t dot that you want. Um, you only have to like figure out that there are multiple ways to do it, maybe. So then you're you're under constraining the problem. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, one thing I should note is really. Uh, whether you're doing joint space control or task space control, you can always write what you want, like the thing that you're trying to achieve as jv dot equals p. jv dot equals p, where p is just a vector. In, in the case of uh, task space control, it's this t dot minus j dot v. And in the case of joint space control, uh, you can have, for example, uh, J is an identity matrix or just like a selection matrix for the joints that you want. Uh, so I V dot equals V dot desired. Or if I have, uh, yeah, if I have three joints, V dot, V1 dot, V2 dot, V3 dot, and I just want to uh, constrain one of them, and I can do, for example, 1, 0, 0. That selects, the selection matrix selects the, the v dot 1 equals v dot v1 dot uh, desired 1, comma. Um. Uh, so, but the, the theme is that you can always write it as j v dot equals p. Uh, which is really nice. Um, So let's let's look at one of those problems now. Uh, yeah. Um, suppose we have an over-constrained system of equations. So that's this one. Um, what happens then? Well, like the best we can do is try to. Yeah, we should we should still try to do as best as we can, right? So we have we have our uh, JV dot equals p. And uh, for example, we don't have enough joints to actually achieve this this thing. So uh, let's just try to minimize the 
distance between j v dot and and p. So so p is sort of a desired thing, and this is what we actually achieve. Achieved. So let's try to minimize the norm of j v dot minus p squared. Um, <coughs> all right, so let's write this as, so this is just uh, j v dot minus p transpose <coughs> j v dot minus p. And let's, write, let's expand that. So we get uh, v dot transpose or let's first just do this, J transpose <coughs> minus P transpose times J P dot minus P equals P dot transpose J transpose J P dot uh, minus P transpose J P dot uh, plus, sorry, minus p dot transpose j transpose p. Uh, p dot transpose j transpose p. Uh, plus p transpose p. <coughs> so that'd be p mm -hmm. dot. Where will v come from? Yeah, it should be p instead of v on your second to last. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, and we're trying to minimize this, this whole thing. So, what can we do? How do you find the mini uh, minimum of such a thing? Uh, take a derivative and find zero. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, if this, this function is differentiable, so uh, if we take the derivative of this thing and then find, find out where it's zero, like Marshall said, uh, then at least that must be a local optimum, either a maximum or a minimum. And it turns out to be... Maybe it's that Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, so if, if we assume that this uh, J has full uh, column rank, I believe, so that all, the, all of the columns of J are independent, it could be row rank, you'd have to look it up, uh, then then it turns out that this is uh, uh, the the thing that minima that minimizes the derivative, or where the derivative is zero, the point where the derivative is zero, is also the the, uh, the minimum. So uh, let's take the derivative of this. So let's call this uh, what should we call this? The beta. Huh? Beta. 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 Beta, I like beta. Okay, so d beta dx is. I had to actually look at look this up today because I'm not, I'm never quite sure how to do this with matrices, but it's uh, two v dot transpose uh, j transpose. Uh, so this term has no. Uh, term in, in uh, v dot, so that's good. And then for both of these things, the derivative is just uh, plus, or sorry, minus, because they're both minus, minus p transpose j. All right, so we wanted this to be zero. So that's gonna be, let's just uh, put the unknowns, or sorry, two, two again, because <laughs> here and here. Uh, so the twos fall out, and we can just write uh, p dot transpose j transpose equals p transpose j. Uh, is this right? Sorry, this is j transpose j. Yeah. 
Uh, and then we can uh, take the transpose of this whole thing so that we get an equation in V dot. Uh, yeah, let's do that. So, uh, so we get J transpose J V dot equals J transpose P. And finally, assuming that this J transpose J thing is invertible, which was our assumption that either the columns or rows are uh, independent, V dot equals J transpose J inverse J transpose P. The pseudo inverse? Yeah, exactly. So this is the more Penrose pseudo inverse. And, and again, so the, the interpretation here is that you're just trying to do your best. Like you're trying to come as close to P as possible in, in the Euclidean sense. Um, and another interpretation is that you're actually projecting this P onto the column space, I think, of, uh, of J. And, and then you're, uh, you're solving, basically. Um, yeah. And that, that should have been delta beta over delta V dot. Delta, yeah, sorry. I think it in terms of X in, on my paper. Yeah. Or D beta D V dot. Uh, v dot is just X double dot. Yeah. Q um, double dot. All right, so that's that's over constrained. Then so can you uh, give an example of over constrained that we might see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that was basically just what I drew. Uh, <laughs> not you can interpret it in multiple ways, but if all of the uh, uh, joints in that thing I drew with the three rigid bodies are just single degree of freedom joints, and you're trying to achieve a spatial acceleration, which is a 6D vector, with the last body, just a general spatial acceleration. Uh, then you, yeah, well, you can't achieve any general spatial acceleration with just three degrees of freedom. Right. So you're just going to have to do your best and achieve it as close as possible. You might not be able to achieve it. And uh, so if, if that goal lies actually in the column space of the Jacobian, then, uh, then you're going to achieve it exactly. And this pseudo inverse is just going uh, to do that because it, that minimizes the norm, of course. Uh, yeah. So another example would be in a, a planar mechanism with just two joints. You might be able to find, get the position, but then you can't control orientation. You can only control, like, you can only reach, you only have two joints, but you couldn't, say, control your arm to go this way. You, you can only control two. You can only control two things, but you need three. Yeah. Yeah. You may want to control position and orientation. But you can yeah. control one position and one orientation. Or you can do that. So or some minimization. A bit. Almost all of them. Um, this is basically a um, minimization problem. Yeah, yeah. So it's an unconstrained, this is uh, basically just, you're doing unconstrained least squares, or just mm -hmm. least squares. Do we use that on, on Atlas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of this, so all of this is being used, but I'm sort of building up right. to, towards more and more complicated stuff. But do you want to give an example of or wait, um, where we used an un over constrained? Uh, well, mm, da, 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 da. let's see. Um, well, I don't really, really, what it, what happens? Um, so, so this this kind of stuff appears um, not only when you're uh, when you have fewer joints than than what's absolutely necessary, uh, but it also appears if if you're in a singularity, because basically what it does is it just takes away one of the joints, and that whole uh, <coughs> yeah. So you, you can you can uh, consider that to be a, a mechanism that has one degree of freedom less, and uh, and then use this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we try to we try to make sure that we don't like uh, unnecessarily over constrain the problem actually. Um,
because uh, that means that you don't leave space to achieve other control goals as well. Uh, so we, we try to be fairly careful, but it is something that can happen. Uh, so yeah, that, that addresses singularities also a little bit. You can uh, do that with a pseudo-inverse. However, uh, with a pseudo-inverse, you have issues near the singularity also. So you can exactly when the problem is uh, over-constrained. Uh, but if you're near being um, a singularity, then you might get V dots that are really, really high. So you have, you have your J V dot equals P, and you're just doing a straight up inverse near a singularity. Uh, that might result in V dots that are like a million in order to just achieve a little bit of um, vertical acceleration of your foot, for example, near a singularity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what you can do is make uh, set up a problem that's that's very similar to this. Um, and, uh, what you do is instead of doing this, you uh, turn it into uh, J dots minus p squared plus lambda squared v dot squared v dot squared. So now you have a penalty term for making v dot really really big. Uh, so yeah, you're you're not trying to just just achieve this thing. You're also trying to make v dot small, like as small as possible. And with this weight, this lambda, you can uh, determine uh, like how how big you allow your joint accelerations to get. So it's sort of a, a control a way to a parameter to choose to choose basically. Is there but if you choose least squares, uh, exactly. Yeah. So this is called damped least squares. Uh, so this is sort of a damping term, dampening term. And uh, choosing this lambda uh, is sort of a compromise between getting huge accelerations near a singularity and uh, achieving what you want to achieve, really. So if you make lambda really big, then it's going to dominate and you're not really achieving what you want anymore. So, so yeah. And another way to write this is, uh, well, th there is also, you, you can derive something similar to the, the more Penrose pseudo inverse that involves this lambda term. Uh, so, so there's a, a closed form solution for that as well. Sure, do like a, not, you know, like a discontinuous function for B instead of, you know, we flow a certain level to zero for the magnitude. Of yeah, that, that would be a good option. Uh, we haven't, we still haven't actually done that. I yeah, think th there are. Uh, it might not become a closed solution then. Yeah. No, no, maybe not. Uh, well, yeah, for, for a, so if you, if you just uh, take your Jacobian and, for example, calculate the determinant and then calcula calculate lambda based on that determinant, uh, you could get better performance. Um, and also, yeah. as soon as you're slightly out of the singularity, your lamp, you're, you choose your lambda quite small because you're just blowing up. Um, so as soon as you're away from, slightly away from your singular conservation, your uh, J V dot minus P is starting to dominate basically also again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least in the papers they showed it like Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It was yeah. like really small, only a really small. Yeah, like an another argument the other way, I guess, would be, I mean, if, if there is no problem, then why do anything about it? Why be lazy, uh, just use the exact, exact solution? Mm -hmm. So there's arguments both ways, I guess. Uh, for us, it's not been a problem to actually use. Um, um, this is what we typically use, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. The only problem is if you get in a singularity, you never get out of it in a game. Yeah. You lost because you use basically smack down any high velocities. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not actually going to talk about that because uh, that will take up a lot of time. Can, like, can uh, you write out what the solution is? Is it similar to the one that was? 
the more brain rows in the so much stats. Something like uh, J transpose uh, or J J transpose plus lambda squared I J transpose or some something like this. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't cost a lot of extra computation. Yeah. Anyway. No, no, no. And you can just leave it to the as an exercise for us to drive it. Yeah. Same way. Okay. All right. So that's that's cool. Um, now, so I've talked about singularities and about over-constrained uh, systems, but you could also have an under-constrained system where you have more joints than than the objective you're trying trying to achieve. Uh, so then what you can do is, uh, so yeah, you still have your j and p dot equals p. Uh, what you can do is set up a, um, a minimization problem like this. Uh, minimize v dot, or yeah, the, the length of v dot squared, subject to uh, j v dot equals p. So you use, you use this as a constraint, and then in addition, you're just trying to make the, the uh, joint accelerations as small as possible. Uh, and of course, you could use some kind of weighting also to, to uh, determine which joint accelerations you find more important to make small. Uh, yeah, same thing works here, actually. Like uh, if you have certain, um, uh, certain things that you find more important to achieve, you can always weight them more by uh, multiplying, pre-multiplying uh, matrix. Does that have closed form solution? Uh, yes, yes. And the answer is again the more Penrose pseudo inverse, but uh, since here we don't have the, uh, uh, the linearly independent, uh, what is it? Columns. Uh, but we have linearly independent rows. Um, this ends up, uh, you, you get a different equation for the more Penrose pseudo inverse, but it still satisfies the properties of a more Penrose, of, of a pseudo inverse. Yeah. However, you can also just treat this as an optimization problem. And there are just solvers. Uh, so th really this is, a, this is called a quadratic program, an equality constrained Quadratic program, and you can just uh, pass this into one of these magic solvers, and it automatically comes up with this v dot uh, vector that you want. So that's sort of how we get into uh, quadratic programming. It's a little bit too early, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that becomes more important later on. This is for under constrained. Yeah, this is for under constrained. However, you can also. Uh, yeah, basically all the all of the ways of solving for a v dot so far uh, have been have been optimization problems. So that's sort of a thing to notice. Okay, um, so that was our robot arm, and we so far we had the assumption that um, all of the joints were actually actuated. So you you come up with this v dot vector, and then you do inverse dynamics, and that gives you taus. And that's all, always possible. Um, but now you want to look at robots that have a floating base. So that's called an uh, under well, an underactuated robot, basically. And an example of that is a, a robot with a floating base like us. We can just move around. And we're not pinned to anything at all times. Uh, so so that sort of limits the motions we can do. Um, what you can do is, is you still have your, your motion constraints. So you could set up a, a, an optimization problem like this. Minimize uh, norm of j v dot minus p squared. Uh, uh, wait, I'm going to first. All right, so we have, we have the equations of motion, m v dot. Uh, plus c equals tau, but now we have certain joints where we can we can't uh, exert any uh, torques across those joints. 
So, so really what we have is uh, M U for underactuated, uh, M actuated times V dot. Uh, is this right? Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's keep this as V dot plus C equals uh, tau. Sorry, this, this should be zero. And this is tau actually. So, um, yeah, let me rewrite this as C, U, and C, K also. And I'll, I'll keep this as a V dot. So, you can consider this sort of to be a constraint, this uh, upper equation here. So we have mu v dot plus cu equals zero. Uh, so what you can do is, if you're also trying to achieve some some desired motion, j v dot equals p, you can write a optimization problem like this: minimize norm of j v dot minus p square subject to uh, mu v dot plus cu equals zero. So that's kind of cool. Now you can do so this is a way you could, you could do under actuated systems. It's actually not how we do it, but uh, we should maybe try sometime. Um, and if you, uh, if you yeah. Okay. So. Uh, we made it. We made one more step, I guess, towards real humanoid robots, uh, which is to remove that uh, 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 the fact that you're fixed to the ground somehow. Uh, but another thing that characterizes humanoid robots is that they actually interact with their environment. So there are like external forces on the robot, and we hadn't actually included those in our equations of motion. So there's no there's no forces here. Uh, so in order to add those in, uh, what ends up being the equation motion is v dot plus c plus j transpose f equals tau, where these f's are the external forces. Um, so what you could do is just adapt this constraint so that it has f's in them. And then actually we need the whole equation because this is sort of a whole, this is a constraint. And now we have these taus appear in the optimization problem. So it gets, it gets a lot more complicated then. Uh, but it, it turns out that you, by looking at the problem in a different way, you can, um, uh, yeah, you can, make it simpler, make a, come up with a simpler optimization problem. Um, so another thing to note is that these Fs, the contact forces, also have limits on them. So that, that's another thing that makes it more complicated. Because if you could just make F anything you want, then you're basically back to the situation where uh, you're locked to the ground. But uh, yeah, we can only uh, push on the ground and the forces can only be inside the friction cones. Right, so we have a certain normal force. Um, if we have F tangential allowed here and normal force here, then it's like mm, F tangential, just like tangential. 
so this this area is uh, the area of forces force vectors you can achieve so so that's uh, another complication um, all right maybe we should take a break here and then uh, after the break I'll explain more about how we solve that